I am going to start while the last uh, few people getting their food. Sorry for the delay, but uh, I think it was more important for everybody to get their food before we start. It puts everybody in a better mood. Uh, OK, so uh, good afternoon and welcome to the Institute for Applied Computational Science seminar series. My name is Pavlos Protopapas, and I'm the Scientific Program Director for the Institute. Uh, just one reminder, one announcement, just a reminder. Next talk is March 23rd by Francesca Dominici, who will be speaking on uh, data science and our environment. The talk would not be here, it will be at the uh, Northwest Building B103. And unfortunately, lunch will not be provided because that's the open day. We're going to have a, a big crowd. Usually, we have a big crowd. So please join us on March 23rd for that talk. Uh, the talks for this uh, seminar series cover very diverse aspects of uh, data science and computational science. Uh, we have talks about how to build search engines. We're going to have a talk about environment and the cosmos. Uh, for you, you have been to many of the talks, this is very diverse. But the question is how data science can help us understand uh, human learning and to how to improve education practices will be the topic of the talk today. I think it fits very well in our uh, seminar series. Um, so it's my pleasure to introduce uh, one of the world's leaders in this topic, Ken Kottinger. Um, Ken is a professor of human computer interaction and psychology at CMU. He has a master in computer science from Wisconsin and then a PhD in cognitive psychology uh, from CMU. He has also been a teacher in Irvine High School. He has done that while he was, I guess, a faculty at the same time. Uh, <clears throat> He has this multidisciplinary background, psychology, teaching, computer science, computer human interaction, and that kind of background supports his research and goals to understand how we learn and how to create better education technologies and to increase uh, student achievement. Uh, I had a very short conversation earlier before I'm keeping you short. Uh, ah, one more thing. He has recently won the Hillman Chair in Computer Science, which is a very prestigious award, at least uh, um, from what I know, and I think it's true. Uh, and I got a chair. And you got a chair. A real chair? Wooden chair. Yeah. chair, wooden chair. Okay. Well, that's good. It's not just a chair. Okay. Yeah. So I had a very short conversation with Ken earlier today, and I learned that uh, most of my intuitions about learning were probably wrong which uh, I think maybe partly explain my teaching ratings. So after this talk, I maybe get better. Uh, so please join me in welcoming Ken. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm glad you guys are not hangry. Uh, good, good, good you got the food. Um, so uh, thanks for that introduction. Um, uh, there's a lot of... Uh, related organizations on my slide here that I'm involved with, and you'll hear about some of them. Uh, so I won't say any more at this moment. But I have one more thing on this intro slide, because um, you know we're going to get into academic technical depth in a moment. But I want to remind me and remind you that we're all uh, in this because we care about kids and about learning, about students. These are my daughters. A uh, few years back, they're now 10 and 6. They're very cute kids. So. Uh, if you don't any, like anything else, I hope you like the picture of my daughters. Uh, so big data and machine learning, you guys know a lot about it. You, you know, you, you, I, I suspect that you know lots of stories of, of how it's made uh, things great in many disciplines, how we've been able to do new things uh, uh, that we could never do before because of it. Um, what about in education? Is it going to have that in, impact on education? Uh, uh, I want to raise that question and then start with uh, an argument against this proposition, um, which basically goes like this. Why do we need data to learn about learner, learning? Because we're learners after all, right? Why can't we just directly uh, report on and observe on and self-reflect on our own experiences? Uh, uh, if that works, fine, then, then why do we need data? Looks like you guys don't buy that argument from your facial expressions, but 
Good, because I'm going to argue against, against the against here. Um, on the for side, uh, I think uh, that personally believe that data analytics are going to yield both a better scientific understanding of how people learn, and I think new technologies driven by scientific insights from, from, uh, from data and theory put together uh, will produce possibly uh, 10 times better learning than we see today. Um, so let me start by uh, arguing against the argument against. Um, so the question there, do learners know when they are learning? Can we see it? And even can they see it? Uh, right? Can we self-reflect on? Uh, sometimes I ask audiences, actually, I'd be interested to know. Do you know when you're learning? Like, who says yes? Who says no? And so 50-50, that's what I've seen before. Uh, it's not a, exactly an obvious question to, 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 uh, to reflect on. Um, but I would say from the literature, if I had to make a yes-no answer, which is never great in, in the social sciences, because there's always more nuanced, but I think the simple answer is no. Um, and much of what we feel like are indicators of learning are illusions. Uh, so let me show you a little bit of some of the evidence uh, that's out there. Um, this is not my work, but others have done this. Um, so first, learners are poor at judging what they know or have learned so far, far. And the particular paradigm that's been explored many times in this regard is to, uh, for example, have somebody read a passage uh, and one studies about baseball. And then they're asked, how well did you understand that passage? And they rate, say, one to five. And then they get questions about the passage. And they look at the correlation at the student level between how high they rated their learning and how well they do on those questions. Or this study asked students, essentially, how good are you at biology? How good are you in literature? How good are you in mathematics? Um, those are the predicted bars on the left. My mo Does the mouse mo work here? There's a mouse, yep. Uh, well, that's interesting. I, it only appears up there. Uh, so that's the prediction. Um, then they gave them a test. And it looks like in biology, they, the, the performance, the actual performance was pretty co close. In literature, it was much below their predictions. In math, it was way below. Um, and then after they took the test, but before they were shown their score, so that's important, right? Um, they were asked to make a post-diction, uh, so-called. Um, and that's what's shown in here. And that suggests that even being asked questions helps you calibrate, uh, right? Um, here's a more detail. It turns out the, the news on biology isn't so good, because if you actually look at the correlation, not just at the averages, uh, the correlation's uh, pretty crappy. I think the biology one is the one that's actually negative in here. Uh, again, after the students see some data, as it were, right, get these questions, they get a little bit better. But these correlations are, are still not all that high. Um, another line of work uh, looks at whether liking is not learning. Like at the college level, how do we get feedback on how well our courses are going? What do we do? We ask students to fill out those evaluation forms at the end, which is basically how much did you like this course, more or less. I mean, we ask how much did you learn, but we already know that how much did you learn might not be very accurate. But certainly, those kinds of questions about how much you liked the course, um, in, in the studies that have then looked at learning outcomes, the, the correlations are, are there quite, are quite low as well. Um, there's a lot of work going on these days in the kind of AI and education literature on various detectors of student engagement or, or like facial detection to see who's confused and so, so forth. And one of the interesting outcomes of that work has been um, uh, engagement is not always a good thing, even though you might think it is. Engagement is sometimes uh, maybe, uh, maybe you're engaged but in the, on the wrong uh, content. And confusion is not always a bad thing. Actually, confusion might indicate that you're struggling in a way that, that uh, can be productive. Um, one of the things you might uh, want to 
reflect on is why uh, is it so hard for students, learners, to make these predictions? And, 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 and I, I hope this seems uh, um, plausible as a story, that learners, in essence, are missing the expertise that they would need to compare to what they know to know whether they really know it or whether they just think they know it, right? And they, like, in some ways, it's like, if you say it that way, it sounds almost impossible, right, for them to know since they don't know. Uh, there's a related issue that to monitor how well you're learning while you're learning produces a kind of extra cognitive load that's problematic. Um, so uh, let me move from these, these things from the literature. And you know, I could point to all kinds of things uh, about how people don't really know themselves very well. This is kind of the story of, of psychology. And, and if you're interested in that, Stuff, by the way, I recommend uh, there's a, a Netflix show called Brain Games, which over and over shows things like some of you may have seen the invisible gorilla demonstration, things like that, right? Uh, you think you're seeing what's out there? Uh, you're not. Uh, so um, uh, later I'll tell you a little bit about um, an intelligent tutoring system, we, uh, actually a full algebra course that we developed that had a major technology component. But in the effort to build that, I uh, wanted to do some investigations around uh, algebra story problems. Um, and uh, in particular, trying to understand uh, what makes those problems hard for students. So um, in, as a good, uh, as I was learning as a computer scientist how to be a good psychologist, I learned about controlling variables. So uh, I matched these problems. You notice that they're essentially all the same problem, right? Just differing on whether there's a story, uh, whether it's in equation form or whether it's in a verbal form. And I made a bunch of these triples and distributed them in what's a, called a Latin square design across a number of different quiz forms. And what I'd like to ask you to reflect on in the moment, at the moment is what I was reflecting on the mo at that time is which of these problems are harder? Uh, and why? Looks like you, you, you've got a thought. No? Yeah, I, yeah. Not really? No? Story? You think the story will be hardest? <laughs> yeah, what I'll show you in a second is data uh, on correctness, uh, you know, probability correct in these categories for high school algebra students, essentially in the Pittsburgh Public Schools where I taught for a little while. Uh, it was about that time, actually, a couple of years later. Uh, they were, it was like in March or April in an algebra class. So that, that, that's the data I'll show you. Um, we actually replicated the result I'll show you many times. But uh, so, so you might think it varies by the kind of student, yeah. <laughs> Uh, sounds like a familiar conversation we had recently. Uh, who thinks the story problem? It's hardest. Hardest, yeah, thanks. Who thinks the word problem is hardest? Uh, a little fewer, but still a lot. Who thinks the equation is hardest? Yeah. Uh, I'm not asking for you, I'm asking for these high school algebra students, right? <laughs> so, anybody want to change their vote then? <laughs> yeah. Can anybody uh, come up with an explanation that would be consistent with, well, either what you believe or, 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 or maybe, like why is the story problem harder? Of being interpreted. Uh -huh. Mathematics, if you know the equation, what a multiply and addition means, there is only one. Uh -huh. way to well, that's that. great, because uh, I want to probe. What is it? You said interpret for one and know for the other. Well, the, the, other, the interpretation is uh, it has only one possible interpretation, right? If you know. If you know, you're, we're assuming you know, you uh, know what multiplication is. Assuming you know the equation language, it only has one interpretation. Yeah, yeah. To you. Well, no, to me. I think that's a universal uh, word, that it has only one interpretation. Uh, you know, but, but for English, for the English yeah, words, there's English multiple interpretations? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, traditionally, we think 
in education that more concrete is easier for kids to grasp. Um, and in this case, and in my experience being the kid, um, it actually just adds a lot of noise for you to have to parse through. So experts look at the story and say, oh, I know what to extract. And students are not experts, so they can get confused by, well, but what does a waiter really do? And, <laughs> uh, and so maybe this, the word problem's a little bit easier because some of the context has been stripped away. And, the important uh, stuff is there. Yeah. Uh, by the way, we did actually as a follow-up to this, because I thought the story problems were hardest. That's why I designed this study. And later I wanted to confirm that I, I'm not wacky, that this is what most math educators and teachers think. You had another thought? Yeah. Then the equation would also be very hard, maybe the hardest, because it's stripped all the context away. So now the, the argument for concreteness uh, starts to apply. But uh -huh. that's, my, that's my guess. Yeah. Well, there is this sort of notion of situated cognition that, that before I did this study, there were some results of uh, Brazilian uh, street vendors, kids who you could ask problems like, how much do these pencils cost? Like these eight pencils that are seven cents each or whatever it was, pesos, or, uh, and they can do that. But if you ask what's eight times seven, they have no idea, right? <laughs> they, could, they could do the problem in the street vending situation, but they couldn't do it in an abstract form. And that seemed very much about context, and that would vote for the story problem being easier. Uh, but it turns out that's not the result either. Um, the equations turned out to be hardest. Uh, there is a slight advantage for story over word that we can isolate to a particular subset of the problems. There was actually a bigger matrix design. There were some whole number of problems and some decimal problems. The, the story problems reduce the error of subtracting 66 from 90. It's not the only, but that kind of arithmetic error because you have the units at $66.90 in the story form. But uh, that error is much more frequent in the word problem than the other. But why is the equation harder? Now, you said when you're an expert, you know. Well, you, well, yeah, you could relate to the story. But the word doesn't have anything in it to relate to, right? And that's substantially better. You said if you know the equation, but how do you come to the know it? Are you born knowing how to read equations? Yeah. Word problem implies the order of operations, whereas someone who's learning algebra might not remember which order the operations need to happen. So there's a grammar of an equation that you have to acquire, right? And, and, and in some sense, it's arbitrarily defined by the conventions of the language, right? There is this thing, order of operations. Yeah, you've been told it. But is that the way you learn grammar? Not your first language grammar, right? You learned it by your brain soaked up lots of examples. Uh, so even if we told you like how to do embedded noun phrases. It probably isn't how you learned how to do it. So probably the same is true for algebraic notation. There's also the lexicon. Like, what does this a asterisk mean? Or we, we actually varied that too. If you do it in the common 6x format, or if you make it n and use an x for multiplication, get the same result for all of those. But in each case, there's a difficulty imposed by those slight notational variations. And essentially, uh, um, the summary uh, of, uh, uh, we did a bunch of studies along these lines, but essentially what, what we came down to is uh, algebra is like a foreign language, and it takes time to learn a foreign language. Uh, English, in, when you're in ninth grade, is no longer a foreign language. Uh, and the mathematics here is simple enough, so it, uh, nobody said this, but I imagine part of what you were thinking is, of course, the story's harder because the way you solve it is by translating it to the equation and then solving the equation. If that were true, that logically would follow. It turns out they solve the story problem by going directly to the arithmetic or sometimes, especially in the word problems, starting with no some number. How about two? <laughs> Multiply it by six, that's 12 plus 66. Oh, that's too small. And they iterate. And usually three guesses, they get it. Um, sometimes more efficient than solving the equation, actually. Another line of research. Wait, like 60% of the high school learners <coughs> do not solve that equation? Yeah, um, and, and there's good questions about uh, both um, the curriculum at the time. I haven't tried this recently, but uh, 
At the, that was before there was a movement to get more algebra into the U.S. curriculum K-12, uh, starting earlier. Um, actually, I did this study in Russia where they start teaching the algebraic notation in second grade, like x plus 3 equals 5. Uh, they do simple equation, it's mathematically simple arithmetic, but in the equation format. And there is no equation word difference for that Russian population. Uh, they actually did a little worse on the story problems, but there's probably poor Russian translation behind that. Have yeah. Have you discussed this with linguists, the experts that, would think, that might think that there is, for grammar, there is more of a universal, it's a, pretty, uh, it's a predisposition to understand that uh, when you're born already, compared you, to math? Like a Chomsky universal grammar, and does it apply to algebra? Right. I have thought about that question, but uh, yeah, uh, yeah. Not, I have never tried to work out whether <laughs> universal grammar applies here. One of the more general takeaways for this, at the time uh, I referred to this as expert blind spot, that the teachers and educators in this domain are blind to some of their expertise. They look at that equation like many of you did and said, simple, right? They know how to do it, but they don't know what they know. They don't know that they've learned this subtlety of the grammar over time. Their brain has soaked it up. Um, their memory of it is one day it just, they learned it, right? Uh, but when we actually look at learning over time, it, it's not a snap like that. We see very incremental progress. And that's basically a, a variation on this general message is that data is going to help us overcome these flaws of our intuition and the fact that we don't really know what we know. Uh, I, I think actually uh, expert blind spot is not a good phrase because uh, um, the, there's evidence uh, that it's much bigger than that. I'll get to in a second. Um, so here's another demonstration. Uh, what's wrong with these uh, sentences? You've had lots of experience with English language. You might say you know the English. You're laughing, what's, what's wrong? Uh, it's uh, improper use of the article, duh. Yeah. Um, can you explain the proper use of the article? I could, uh, I, I could in French, which but I had to learn. You but, could in French, but in, right. but in English, I can't. Yeah. No. Uh, Hopefully no one would say this, although if you spell it out, it actually doesn't sound that unreasonable. Like, you have had lots of experience with the English language. People just wouldn't say you've had lots of experience with the, with the English language. It seems colloquial to me. Well, I was focusing on with English language, by the way, not the you. But there's, there's probably other weirdnesses of my own grammar that you're, <laughs> that you're digging into. But, but if you're a first language English speaker, you know how to use articles. Turns out there's probably about 150 distinguishable rules for article use. Um, did you have any idea? Like you know all 150 quite well. I could give you all the sentences and you would get them all right, right? So you know it but you don't know you know it. Um, uh, so uh, uh, it's not a blind spot. There's this literature uh, uh, that suggests experts are unaware of about 70% of their knowledge. They're only consciously aware of about 30% of their knowledge. Uh, and this literature comes from uh, various cognitive task analysis where uh, one, there are many forms of co cognitive task analysis. There are think aloud, structural, structured interviews. I'm going to show you a kind of uh, quantitative approach to it. Um, but the, the structured interview approach, for example, goes to surgeons. This is a study on teaching catheter insertion surgery. And it interviews a surgeon and says, how do you do catheter insertion surgery? And they give a self-report. And it's this much. And you know, these are the steps for it. Um, and that's, that's the starting point. That's what they know they know. But you probe them, because it seems like you missed a step between here and here, right? And then they start elaborating. And then you go to a second expert and ask that same question. And you find the non-overlaps. And you start building out both the union across the experts, but also something that logically makes sense where all the gaps are filled in. And you eventually get to the 100%. And you compare it back to what you got originally from the expert. and it's. It's only 30% of it. That's essentially the paradigm by which they got to that 70% number. But the other neat thing about it is, um, you know, 
for content even, you know, that's taught at a med school by very smart people, when they do cognitive task analysis and then redesign the instruction, now teaching some of the 70% they weren't explicitly, they didn't explicitly think about addressing in the past, they get better outcomes, substantially better outcomes. Uh, so Richard Clark and colleagues have done a number of these studies with effect sizes, if you know that notion, uh, as big as 1.5 standard deviation, the difference between the treatment that got the instruction based on cognitive task analysis and the control, which was the standard medical school instruction, um, shows uh, uh, if the variance on the uh, control condition scores is in standard deviation terms, it, it's uh, 1.5 times that variance. Um, so uh, I hope these examples, uh, um, if you needed convincing, um, are helping to convince you that self-reflection does not work to understand and improve learning, and that there's a huge opportunity in education to use data. So I'm going to go into that, um, and uh, I'm going to start first kind of by telling you some history of our cognitive tutors and, and some improvements that led to effective uh, outcomes, and then go back a little bit and talk about how the data tells us, gives us some insights about the process. Um, so uh, when I was uh, teaching geometry in this school, it was as a consequence of having built a, I built an AI system that could come discover geometry proofs and built an intelligent tutoring system for it and went out to the schools and tried to use it w to help teach geometry. And then I did some of the regular classroom lecturing and stuff. Um, and then we de decided we should do the same for algebra, but do it better. And, and lo longer story about that, but part of that was about recognizing that technology is not something you just say, you, you know, teachers here, try this. Because they say stuff like, well, what am I not going to do if I do this, right? And so we decided in this algebra project to, we, we uh, work with teachers to write their text as well as the software, and it was a whole integrated package. But on the technology side, the key idea uh, behind this adaptive tutoring system is to have a system, an AI system, that can solve problems in the various ways students can. And this is a very simple example from algebra equation solving, but it illustrates a key point, which is that um, uh, there are often different ways you can address a goal, um, which you know is reasonably generic here, but in some sense quite specific, uh, generic in the sense that a, B, C, and D can be any number, specific in the form of this. Actually, the most general form is A, B, and C, and D can be any expression, right? And depending on how you write this, um, it could work that way. Whether it works that way in student learning or not is a good question. Uh, but notice here, this is the strategy of, of doing the distribution. This is a strategy of dividing both sides by A. And here's a common error that students make, which is to multiply A uh, just by B and not by C. So when we're, uh, when the system's applied to a particular context, no matter how uh, the, the system got to this stage, these rules apply. The previous could have been a more complex equation, it could have been a story problem that was translated to this. The neat thing about these production system models is they, they, they're compositional, right? They can be used to produce all kinds of different behavior by combining them in novel ways. Um, so if we have a model like this, it doesn't have three rules, it has a, 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 a maybe 500 for high school algebra, uh, we can use it in, a, in the system with an algorithm we call model tracing, which follows students through their individual approach to a problem. So imagine two different students are at this state or uh, an isomorphic version of it. One goes this way, one goes that way, both good for different reasons. Both are now in different places, so if they ask for help next, they would get different help. And of course, this student is going to get some kind of feedback if they go there. So we can attach instruction um, in the form of hints to the correct rules and in the form of error feedback, we call bug messages, to the rules characterizing misconceptions. So that's one level of adaptivity to different strategies. And then at another level, um, at the more curriculum level, we can use these latent uh, descriptions of knowledge, as it were, these abstractions of knowledge, to assess uh, students' knowledge growth and then 
individualize the selection of activities and the pacing such that uh, we can monitor whether students are learning each of the rules or not. And then if they know it, don't give them a problem associated with it. If they don't, uh, give them a problem associated with that. Um, so that, those are the, that's the sort of key insight, sort of a simple way of doing individualized one-on-one -on -one tutoring once you have that co cognitive model, which isn't simple, but the rest is reasonably simple. Uh, so, um, uh, oh, by the way, there are the algorithms for doing this estimation. There's a whole literature on the best way to do that. Uh, there's a Bayesian knowledge tracing approach. Um, there are other approaches, um, uh, um, FYI. Uh, um, these, the cognitive tutors are, that are fielded use this Bayesian knowledge tracing approach. So just to give you an example of a more complex activity um, in the algebra cognitive tutor, here students are working on an authentic problem scenario to analyze two different cell phone plans. Um, one uh, has this monthly rate and this per minute rate. One has a different monthly rate and a different per minute rate. And you can imagine this is one of those crossover kinds of analyses, right? And they're asked to work it out in a table where they're filling in these cells. So we're asking them to identify the relevant quantities, the relevant units, um, assign a variable for the uh, independent uh, uh, quantity time here, write an expression for the current cost, and uh, ho I hope you can see this point one three t is uh, is missing that intercept basically, right? And the error feedback message is pointing that out in context. So the instruction is in context of doing, right? Um, it's learned by doing with interactive feedback. Uh, there are challenging questions like this intercept question, and if students stuck at any point. They can push this hint button, and now they get instruction that's contextualized for the problem they're experiencing at the moment. It's not a one lecture for all, I tell you it no matter whether you need it or not. It's I tell you it only when you ask for it in the context when you need it. Uh, so that's your mini specialized little lecture <laughs> on, on the content you need now. But critically, when you get help, the knowledge tracer is going to recognize that you don't know it yet, so you don't. In, in essence, get credit for knowing it, but you get an opportunity to learn it. And we're going to then track over time with this Bayesian knowledge tracing uh, whether you've actually shown you can do it. So you might have gotten help earlier. And if you keep pushing the hint button, it eventually says, you know, type in 25, right? It'll give you an example of what to do. But it's back to you to get it right. Uh, so over the years, since the early 90s, there have been many studies. Uh, we spun off a company in 1998. Um, I think it's fair to say that this was the first uh, large-scale personalized AI tutoring system in schools uh, starting in the early 90s. About a half million students have been using it for, per year for, for many years now. One of the more recent studies, 2013, is probably one of the largest randomized field trials in ed education. There were 140 schools, 70 assigned to use the curriculum and, and 70 uh, randomly assigned to do what they regularly do for algebra. Uh, and they did it over two years. Turns out the differences were not so big in the first year, and I'm reporting results on the second year, so there seems to be an adoption lag there. But uh, in the second year, um, if you look at the gain over the school year of the cognitive tutor students as compared to the gain in the control, the gain is twice as much uh, over the school year. It's estimated to be twice as much. So really a substantial uh, improvement. Um, this is a shift in a distribution that suggests that that improvement is working for students, whether they're at the low end, whether they're in the middle, or whether they're at the high end. Um, uh, there are some details of this that are not so encouraging, like, like the 40% <laughs> performance. Uh, that's still true. Lots of students in the real world, in real schools, struggle uh, to learn this stuff. Um, the actual gain over a full school year in the control condition um, is surprisingly small. Uh, so doubling it is still not all that big. There's plenty of room for improvement. Um, and that's partly why I think we can do 10 times better. Um, but this is two times better. So we got a 2x uh, um, uh, demonstration here. Um, without doing all the AI, we 
started a project at CMU uh, to bring these, this kind of approach, particularly the learning by doing with feedback, uh, into online courses at the college level. And so that was in the early 2000s. And uh, there are now uh, probably closer to 40 uh, courses, uh, uh, open, the OLI, uh, Open Learning Initiative courses, that are being used by lots of students. And one of the best studies um, uh, on the OLI was, for, uh, was with an OLI statistics course where they ran it in a blended version in half a semester and compared it to the usual way of teaching statistics, this is at CMU, in a full semester. Uh, and they also did a, um, a beeper study during one week of the course to identify work time where the, the buzzer would go off and the student would write down whether they're working on statistics or not. And they also had them self-report the how much time they were spending outside of class and those results converged and they suggested that the half semester folks were not compensating by working twice as hard they were working the same amount per week so essentially working half the time um, yet uh, there's this standardized uh, uh, um, statistics test called the chaos test uh, interestingly I think concepts in assessing something uh, uh, or comprehensive assessment of statistics uh, that they used as one form of, of assessment. And actually, the uh, adaptive online course produced a bigger gain in half the time than the other. Um, so another uh, indication of potentially two times faster. Um, so uh, that's, I kind of whipped, there, you know, there's data behind it. I showed you the, the algebra investigation thing we did on paper. Um, I'll come back to some more data. But I, I, uh, what I want to do now is dig into a little bit like the opportunity to take courses like this that are in widespread use and do basic research at scale in them. And uh, that's what we did with a lot of uh, support from NSF over a 10-year period in collaboration with the University of Pittsburgh, some folks in, uh, in Europe and so forth. And we built out this infrastructure for helping researchers, you know, especially psychologists who like to run their learning studies in the lab, to get out and run studies in the real world uh, context of classrooms. Uh, so that was a fundamental social part of the social cyber inter infrastructure, which Learn Lab is. Um, the technical part included uh, instrumentation of all of these courses. And I notice I haven't updated this, copied these slides from somewhere else. It's actually 1,500 data sets now in the repository that we built, DataShop. And I want to show you something about that. We also did tons of what we called in vivo experiments. Um, you might have heard the phrase in industry, A-B tests. But this is basically the same idea. We vary the instruction in a particular way and see what the outcomes are for learning. And today I'm not going to talk about those, but that's a whole other line of work we've done. Uh, what I want to do is to say in how you can do cognitive task analysis in a data science kind of way. And, and the fundamental idea here is if we have a good cognitive model of the grain size and the units in which students are learning, it should be one then that Though those are essentially latent variables in a model that should produce a good fit uh, of learning curves. You should see smooth learning curves if you got the model right. So let, let me illustrate how that works. Um, so here's the setup of a learning curve where I have on the x-axis opportunities to practice. And what I'm going to show on the y-axis is an average across students of the error rate. Right. So if I have 100 students and 40 of them uh, get the answer wrong, right, then it's a 40% error rate, right? That's on their first time to do it. What about their second time? And we compute that average, right? So what should happen to the learning curve for error rate? It should go down, right? Um, so here's a, here's a learning curve from a unit on geometry area where we just ordered the experiences students are having as they had them in the curriculum. And that's what it looks like. Is that a smooth declining learning curve? Um, is the unit of knowledge acquisition in geometry, the more geometry the do, I do, the better I get at geometry? Does that sound plausible? 
it, it did to some gestalt psychologist many years ago. That was the faculty theory of, of learning. Like, the more Latin you learn, the better you become at languages. So it'll make you better at learning any language. Or the more uh, uh, chess you play, the better you get at reasoning. So you'll be better at legal reasoning, that sort of thing, right? Uh, the more geometry you do, do you get better at geometry? It doesn't seem to be showing up in this, in this data. So wh why not? Anybody have any, why, why isn't it working? Yeah? The questions are getting harder. Uh, so well, not systematically harder. But you're saying this is in order of the curriculum, right? Yes. Right. So the later in the curriculum, you're leveraging what you learned earlier, and they're more complex questions. They're, they're different, different questions. questions. Yeah. yeah. They, they may be more complex indeed or they may be different. By the way, this is data on steps in solving problems. So in some ways, it already accounts for the complexity of the problem, because a complex problem will have, say, five data points from, whereas a simple, because we have, because it's five steps and a simple, right? So we're, the, in some ways, it's controlling for that, and we're still not seeing it. But maybe figuring out rectangle area isn't as hard as trapezoid area, right? Uh, so, just knowing one doesn't mean the more you practice rectangle area, does it make you better at finding the area of a circle? That's exactly the question we're asking. What is the unit size of transfer? We can use data to figure that out. That's the, that's the insight here. The unit of transfer is what the cognitive model is fundamentally, right? So, DataShop allows you to uh, display these learning curves, and here we have one knowledge component, geometry, right? And we get this rough curve, right? Uh, without decomposition, no smooth learning curve. But what if we take this exact same data and divide it up into 12 different, uh, you call them concepts or skills, whatever you want. We're going to relabel those steps to say some are about circle area, some are about trapezoid area, right? What, what happens to the curve? Uh, it starts to look like a learning curve, yay. The error rate is going down with opportunities to practice uh, circle area. But the, the particularly powerful thing about this is that those 12 components might not be right. They're certainly better than the one, but are they the right 12? Um, and we can use this criteria of smooth learning curve and we can define it statistically and then iterate over possible models to find the best one. So uh, the way we do that statistically is we have uh, basically, if you know any psychometrics, there's this notion of item response theory which says every student has a proficiency. Um, in an item response theory, every item has a difficulty. We're going to generalize that to say that every item gets coded as needing a particular uh, component of knowledge and that component of knowledge has a difficulty. So that gives us the generalization, two items Two circle area items should be similar in their difficulty. And they should be similar in that if I practice one task with feedback, I'll get better at the other. If I practice circle area, I get better at circle area, but not at trapezoid area. Um, actually, one of the questions we asked here is if you practice going forward with the formula to find the area, does it get you better at going backward, like where you're given uh, the area and everything but one of the parameters. I don't know if you have an intuition about that, but turns out the direction doesn't matter except for circle area. Uh, and I can explain why, but that, that goes to, again, the subtlety of this. Um, I'm going to show you in a moment how we use this to improve instruction, but I first want to do a little bit of, uh, of an exploration of uh, sort of more what we could learn scientifically about this. We have hundreds now of data sets in DataShop. They're from geometry and Python programming and psychology and Chinese learning as a second language, algebra, English as a second language, chemistry, physics, comma, dot, 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 dot. Um, not a lot of elementary data, uh, but some uh, uh, middle school data, high school data, um, and college data. A lot of college data from OLI, a lot of middle and high school data from cognitive tutor authoring tools, developed little units. But they're intelligent tutors, they're online courses, they're ed educational games, it's a variety of technologies. Um, this is the average uh, geometry curve that I just showed you. I just showed you two of them. This is from a Python program simulation tutor. Um, uh, doesn't look exactly the same, but 
One thing that you see consistently across these do domains could be characterized qualitatively as slow but steady progress. The error rate is going down with every opportunity to practice, but not by a huge amount, right? And it's definitely not one-shot learning. Like, like my daughter learned to ride a bike that one day in March. You know, kind of seems that way. But when I think about it, <laughs> it's not how it happened, right? She was on the, with the training wheels for a long time, and she did the push bike for a while, and then that first day where it sort of seemed like she rode it, she was kind of falling over and wobbling, right? It was actually gradual. But I think we often have this experience when we look back, right, that it was, I got it that one day, right? Our data, we never see that in this data, uh, um, certainly not at the aggregate level. Um, quantitatively, uh, we can use that model I showed you to get an estimate of the learning rate in the, in the logistic or log odds form. And roughly speaking, across these data sets, we see about a tenth of a log odds reduction in error for each. Um, it's important, by the way, that these are interactive learning opportunities where they're getting feedback with knowledge of results, that they're good quality explanatory feedback, because that's what produces the learning. Um, you might think that's kind of slow, but um, I've done some back of the envelope, envelope calculations to compare it, uh, for example, with there's this notion that to become an expert in, in any domain, you need about 10,000 hours of practice, and some, some of you are nodding. Uh, Gladwell popularized this in some of his books, maybe Blink first, right? Yeah, and then got the original psychologist in tr trouble because people said, it's not exactly 10,000 hours. <laughs> he said, it was Gladwell that said that. I, I never said it was exactly, but like Mozart, even though he was a prodigy, actually didn't produce his first you know, major respectable symphony until he was 16, but he started writing them when he was six, right? So even in that case, it was 10 years. Uh, um, you can make certain assumptions, uh, like how many knowledge components is in expertise. Uh, Herb Simon much estimated 50,000 in chess. It takes 50,000 chunks of knowledge to become a chess expert. And you can say, well, if you start at a certain average error rate, like 50%, and you compute that you need to get to, say, 80 or 95, you can pick your threshold, right? You can, and then you say each one of those opportunities takes about 20 seconds. Um, you can compute something. Most of the times I've done that with reasonable parameters, I get closer to five years. And maybe that's because in naturalistic learning, you don't get very good inter interactive feedback like you get from one of these online tutoring systems. But in either case, um, they kind of conform to this slow and steady kind of thing. I mean, I think that's, that's one of the key takeaways. Um, there's no evidence of sudden insight. I think one way that makes this plausible, if you think about neuro, neurons and how they change, there probably is a rate limit on how fast the biology changes, right? And especially to become expert in something, the brain really has to physically change, right? That takes time. Uh, one of the things that I think is really positive about this message is the steady part. It looks like, um, and, uh, I didn't go into this, but we looked for variation in learning rate across students, and it's surprisingly little. That it's really hard to find a learner who doesn't make progress, and it's really hard to find a learner who seems to make much faster progress than anybody else. They may vary incredibly, even though they're nominally in the same course, Students vary a, a ton in terms of their intercept on these learning curves. Uh, and, and that variation kind of generalizes across all of the content in the domain. The hard stuff's hard for everybody. Uh, as a sweeping generalization, there are definitely variations. But, um, so I said earlier we could do better than that 12. What we can do is show the learn, the, it, or inspect the learning curves for each of the components. And some of them are going down reasonably well. It's, you know, it's noisy. This is like 60 students, so it's not a huge data set. On the other hand, it's nice that 60 students is enough to get some insight. Here's a curve that's not going down, right? That one kind of looks like the first one I showed you, right? And it, and it might imply that we don't have the knowledge decomposition right. So we can drill down and find all the steps and all the problems that we labeled with that. It turns out there are steps in problems like 
this one where you have to take two formulas and combine them to compute some irregular shape. Uh, uh, like subtract the circle out of the square to get the leftover or add the triangle on top of the square to figure out how much, yet, how much paint you need to use to paint the house, that sort of thing. Um, so the error rate on those different steps varies tremendously. So that's not a good sign. Like if, like if the idea is that this is a component you learn and once you learn it, you can do all these tasks, it should be much tighter. And if we look at the other ones, the red is the error rate here across these. And obviously they're sorted by difficulty. Uh, so what's going on? Um, this problem's hard, or this step in this problem where I'm finding this area of the scrap metal. These two are easy. Here's one that's kind of medium. Um, uh, you know, you can look, you look at these problems and you go, oh, maybe it's because the circle and the square is separate. And then you can go look at other problems and see if that's consistent. If that doesn't work out very well. Um, you could go, oh, there are these extra columns in here in this problem that ask you for the square and the circle before it asks you for the combo. Those columns aren't there in this problem. That actually seems to work. If you scaffold, it makes it easier. This is medium, this is hard. Why is this so easy? These are just different numbers. You formulated the plan, and once the plan's formulated, if we give you different numbers, you can execute the arithmetic just fine because you're a 10th grade student, right? So these become really easy. So we make a three-way distinction. Um, here's the original model that made no distinction against the data. It doesn't fit very well. The three-way distinction is not perfect. There are some that are way off, but generally much better. Um, and of course, there's noise in this data, so um, that would account for it. But, uh, or, well, actually there may be other difficulty factors we haven't, or hidden skills, as we sometimes call them, that we haven't identified. But we've made an improvement. We can test for that statistically. We can go back to this logistic regression model. Uh, we can use various prediction fit metrics uh, to, because we're going to be comparing models that have more parameters against models that have fewer parameters. So uh, we need to do something uh, for that, like AIC, BIC, cross-validation. So DataShop provides all of those. Um, in this case, we were testing this hypothesis that this scale of composing formulas is really multiple skills. So we can test that hypothesis by comparing one model against the other. Here's a bunch of models for the same data set. The two we were comparing are here. And they're sorted by AIC currently, such that uh, the statistics, not only are these numbers small um, in perception, but they are, the differences are also small. Uh, so you might say, yeah, nice, you improved the root mean squared error reduction by a little bit, but big deal. Uh, so here's where the real proof in the pudding is. Did we learn something valuable that we can use to redesign the course? That's what we really care about, right? Um, so uh, we go around this loop, right? We had an employment deployment of this course. We collected data and we made some discoveries. Now we make some design choice changes we produce a new version, V2, and we do one of these in vivo uh, experiments, a randomized controlled experiment inside of the course where we test version one against, version two against version one and use the data to evaluate improvement. We actually did two stu such studies and there were like uh, three or four different ways that we used this insight to make changes. But the one that was most effective is, um, uh, by analogy, something like, you imagine you want to get better at playing tennis, right? And one way to, you might think of that, this is sort of the problem-based learning approach, is the way to get better at tennis is to play tennis, right? I guess the, the college, the typical college level approach would be to listen to a lecture about tennis, right? <laughs> um, so obviously for physical activities, that's not a great idea. Might, also not be a good idea for mental activities, but, uh, um, but maybe your problem isn't everything in tennis. Maybe it's your serve that's problematic. Or maybe it's the way you toss the ball in your serve that's problematic, right? So the idea is we just use data to identify a particular problematic thing. And now what we should do is isol find a way to isolate practice on that particular prob problematic thing. Um, so 
no fancy AI system, we actually just created some multiple choice questions that asked students to formulate a plan for how they were going to use formulas to solve these irregular shape problems. And they didn't have to execute. And so the idea was, you know, all that time wasting doing your forehand in a regular tennis game that you're already good at, you're not going to do. You don't have to compute the formulas. Um, you just have to formulate a plan. That's not the only thing they were doing, but they had those activities available to them in the treatment. Um, and uh, so uh, I guess that slide somehow got out of order. But he, uh, first thing we looked at, um, because these tutors have a mastery criteria, we can look to see how much time it takes to convince the tutoring system that the students have mastered. So in this treatment version two, um, they spend 25% less time and most of the savings is on not doing all those area formulas that they're mostly pretty good at, right? And we actually increased the amount of time they spent on the harder thinking activities of planning. Um, so some people look at this and say, I don't care about time. But I think if you're a parent paying for college, you might be happy to pay for three years rather than four years, right? That's a 25% reduction. Yeah, you're, you're, in, you're in on that one? Yeah. Um, but of course, we want to see whether the outcomes are at least as good. And we, what we see is particularly on the harder planning problems, the treatment is actually doing better in less time. Uh, so we've closed the loop, right? We, made, we used data to make a discovery that led to a design. We did an A-B test. Using that design, we get better outcomes. Uh, this, if you kind of combine the time and the outcome, it's about a 1.5 in improvement in learning efficiency. Um, so I can see I have too much content here that for the time allowed. So I, I'm going to skip ahead here and, and, and try to close out. Um, uh, we have this search algorithm that automates this process. And, and uh, uh, one of the important things about that is that there is a point in which the human expert gets involved. Uh, but like. Here, all these LFA things are machine-generated cognitive models, and we've shown in this paper that we can make improvements on the best human or by-hand model consistently across a wide variety of domains with this algorithm. And actually, one reflection of the improvements is, is better learning rates. Um, so that's kind of the explanatory models are critical in that you need data science and disciplinary expertise in psychology and the subject matter to, to, to be uh, better. The last part that uh, I was, uh, if we had more time, I could tell you about uh, some of the work we've been done, doing on building simulated students um, and how I think that theory advancement part, computational models of human learning that learn like humans, is, is going to be a big part of the story of getting from two times to 10 times better. Um, this slide lays out a set of steps we could take to get to that two, uh, 10 times better. Um, and uh, the, this part uh, sets up one of the things we discovered from this computational model, SimStudent. Uh, it uses four different machine learning algorithms. If you want to ask in the questions for a demo, I'll show you a demo on that page. Um, one of them is a representation learning algorithm that uses probabilistic context-free grammars to induce the structure of the domain. And we're able to build these cognitive models by learning them. And then we apply the same kinds of uh, uh, learning curve fits that I described. And in these three of these four domains where we taught simulated student algebra, stoichiometry, fraction addiction, and article selection, the the and a uh thing, um, the discovered model was better than the human-generated model. And there's some intuitive explanation for why. Uh, so that was my story. Um, uh, I hope you no longer believe in this argument against and you believe in the argument for. Um, we've been producing a lot of resources. This slide is, uh, is, is the candy store of resources that we have. Um, one of them is a summer school we're, we're running at the end of uh, July this year, where there is a track on educational data mining, on intelligent tutoring system authoring, on online course authoring, um, and there's some language uh, modeling uh, for learning that are part of that too, uh, Carolyn Rose's bizarre uh, stuff. Uh, the application is going to be out soon, so if, if anybody's interested, I encourage you to 
to, to look into that. Um, and so thank you very much. <laughs>